Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Hello and welcome to Phoenix Business Radio, broadcasting live from the Max 6 Entrepreneurial Center right here in Tempe, Arizona, where we help build businesses and connect you with the right people. These folks have been around for a while. I'm looking forward to having a conversation today with Lou and Andy Hobaika. They are the founders of One Bag at a Time, in addition to Hobaika Services. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. All right. So let's have you both introduce yourselves and, and take some time. We've got plenty of time on this in this conversation today. I'd love to hear about, gosh, your family business and who you are and the role that you play, and then we'll just see where it goes. I'm looking to... Yeah, let's start off with Lou. Senior here first. Sure, (laughs) yeah. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, so uh, Lou Hobaika started with my father back in the early 1900s. His parents were Lebanese immigrants and had two daughters. And in Lebanon, it was kind of like today. It wasn't a great place to raise your family. So my grandfather picked up his cell phone and sent his brother, who had a dry goods store in Phoenix, Arizona. I don't think it really happened that way in like 1917. But, you know, by mail, which would be probably four, six, eight weeks to get a letter, had a dry goods store here and said, hey, brother, you know, why don't you come to Phoenix, Arizona, United States, land of opportunity and raise your family here. So it was a three-year journey, car, boat, train, foot, car, boat, train, foot. And my father was actually born in Cuba on their way over. So now they had three kids, made it over here. My father grew up in Phoenix, went to St. Mary's grade school, high school. And then, you know, something happened in uh, 1939 called World War II. So every able-bodied man and woman was... Uh, deemed to fight for our country. And most of them weren't citizens at that time because these were mainly immigrants. My father was uh, fluent in both Spanish and English and Lebanese, so three languages because his parents were Lebanese. So anyways, drafted to the Army, served his term under the GI Bill, had an education grant, uh, went to Phoenix College. He was really handy, construction, electrical, plumbing, uh, just a very handy guy in the, in the army where he served. He was a radio operator, so very technical and uh, liked to work with his hands, could fix just about anything. So he goes to the counselor at Phoenix College and he says, you know what? I'd like to be an electrician. I want to have my own electrical business. And the counselor said, you know, I'm sorry, Paul, but the school's full. We don't have any room, but we have a new and upcoming industry trade. I think that may fit you well because it's electrical, it's plumbing, it's mechanical, all of what you have and you could have your own business. It's called refrigeration. (laughs) So this is before air conditioning and, you know, 1945-ish, just refrigeration, you know, for food, products, uh, grocery, dairy farms, things like that, meat, poultry. So he opened, um, he went and graduated, got his refrigeration degree and business degree. And then worked for a few small companies. And in 1952, he opened Hobika's Refrigeration. Uh, Had seven kids. And basically, if we weren't in school, we were working. You know, we didn't have the privilege of um, having time off and fun time. You know, evenings, weekends, holidays, summers, we were working. So that's just the way we grew up. Fast forward, seven kids. Uh, We all grew up in the business. My brother Paul and I bought the business in 1989. My father retired. At that time, it was a small company of eight people. And Paul and I were two of them, but we were both college graduates. My brother, Paul, an engineer and myself, a business major in finance and accounting and management. So um, we, our goal was to grow the business and just uh, own a larger share of the Phoenix uh, metro market and grow our services. So we quickly started to grow uh, personnel as well as services. So we added trades, plumbing, drain, sewer, electrical, uh, wine rooms and other specialty wine cellars. So a lot of different things just in owning the home was our whole goal and mainly a residentially focused business. So 90% of all of our business is residential and maybe 10% would be a light commercial. But I think the major thing that, you know, we took from our father was, uh, you know, we're, we're real humans, we're, we're people and uh, we hire and um, train and coach on likability. So we never look for anybody with inspir- any experience or skill set. We actually don't want anybody with any field experience or skill set. We would rather bring somebody in that has dreams and aspirations for a better future, family, kids, home, car, what they want in their future. And then our business is the place to be able to earn the income to achieve those dreams and aspirations. So we're a family, you know, organization and we just hire for the personality Mm skill set of likability. When you like somebody, you know, you trust them. And you just like being around them. They market themselves well. They're sincere. 
kind of like somebody, if your grandmother needed some service and she lived alone, that you would trust in your grandmother's home without anyone else being there because, you know, they'd be honest and ethical doing the right thing. So that's what we hire for. And then we teach skills. It, we, we teach for the skill set. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to train and teach people personality skills because whatever they have, you know, by the time they're, you know, in their early 20s, I'm sorry if they're screwed up, it's because their upbringing, their parents screwed them up. So uh, their parents brought them up right, and they have, they market themselves well. They're likable. They're trustworthy. They're honest. They're ethical. They have integrity. They're sincere. That's what we look for. It's easy to teach the skill set, but not the likability. So Andy uh, grew up in the business. I have three sons, pretty much the same way I did. You know, if Andy wasn't in school, he was working. So, you know, he started in the field. And pretty much did everything, whether it was HVAC, different trades, installation, then he moved into service, then he moved into sales, and Andy's been in sales for probably the last 10 or 12 years, uh, just doing phenomenally well. And Andy now has two kids, but I'll turn it over to Andy, <laughs> and he can, you know, wrap up with the Hobica Services story. Yeah, so, yeah, Hobica Services, it was always one of those things, you know, growing up in my family, uh, I think everybody my other brothers and cousins and family, they all worked at Hobica, but only so, so many of them lasted because, you know, not a lot of people want to go through a 160-degree attic in the middle of the summer running duck work and insulation. <laughs> but my motivation mainly at that young of an age was I remember back in the day watching like a Gone in 60 Seconds movie or Fast and the Furious and my dad saying, hey, Ange, you like those cars? I said, yeah. And he says, which one do you like the most? Which one do you want when you're 16, when, you know, when you're able to drive? And I said, I want that one. He goes, great. Well, we better start working because I'm not helping. <laughs> So it was, it was the motivation of like nice things. Like you want to have extra things. You want to do these things. And I knew when I was 16, I wanted to have a car like a lot of my friends did or, you know, at that age. And I was like, I better start working. So you, you really learn at a young age when your father tells you, you know, you're going to work really hard and you're going to appreciate it so much more. And it happens. Your friends put a fingerprint on that car. They're washing that vehicle because it is everything to you. And you, you instill that in your, you know, your growth and it just makes you a better person. So that's, that's, that's how my dad brought us up in the right way. And, uh, I'm very uh, fortunate for that. But yeah, I've been working for my dad since I was about maybe 11 or 12 and worked all the way up in everything, like he said. And uh, I found myself in the comfort expert position sales because- What does that mean? I love talking to people. Yeah. So it's it's mostly, you know, a lot of people say, Andy, you're in sales. And it's like, well, technically I'm in a sales position, but not, not you know, actually, I, I, I just, I'm really good at building relationships. I love building relationships. Some people can go over to a home or have someone come into like, you know, a car dealership and they're going to sell something. I would much rather just create a relationship because at the end of creating that relationship, if that person actually trusts me and I've created that friendship, they'll pretty much buy anything that I have because now they built that relationship. They know I'm out there for their best interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that wraps back up to the whole likability because when you sell yourself and people like you, people actually buy you first. And then if you have a solution to a problem that they may have at that time, then you can offer solutions. So they actually buy the individual before they buy a product or service. So mm -hmm. likability, and that's what Andy has. He has likability. But wrapping up back to when he was a kid and he wanted to buy the car and you need to work for it, dad's not going to help you. But him and his brothers also ask the question, he says, well, I don't quite understand. All my friends, their parents buy everything for them. <laughs> I've got their a 15-year-old. I get Everything. This. And I said, you know what, guys? I said, that's not the way we do it. Yeah. I said, you don't understand really the lesson you're going to learn. But you know what? When you're an adult, you'll thank me. And as well, my dad would always bring us up and say, you know, well, that's the way they do things. You're a Hobica. This is our name. And this is how we do things. And it just made me very proud to be a Hobica and be, you know, oh, my God, my dad is a badass pretty much just because he's making us do these things. And now as an adult, you look back and you're like, holy crap. It was all worth it. The reason I'm successful, the reason I'm so good with people, the reason I'm so good at everything in life is all because of our upbringing. My mom and dad are amazing. So it's he good. He gave you space to figure that out early yeah. on yeah. and yeah, modeled it for you. So yeah. one other real interesting thing about uh, 2000, um, as our business was growing, we wanted to brand our company a little bit more strategically. So I, I paid a ex-radio announcer to write a jingle for us. <laughs> and he wrote like six jingles. And the one that stuck is you like a whole bica. Um, I can sing it at some point. Maybe at the end we'll close it out. <laughs> okay, but anyways, let's so not you that. like Hobby oh, Jingle? We've been on the radio for years, off and on. Andy was in probably freshman year high school. His brother was maybe a sophomore junior. And this radio 
jingle came out, you like a hobika. They hated oh, me I for bet. it. Everybody <laughs> made did. fun of all my kids. You're you still, like a hobika? He still doesn't like it. I yeah. just got no, no, this I, But you know I what? Like you know what? They said, you know, Dad, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Everyone's making fun of me. This is stupid. I don't like it. And I said, it's trust me. When you're an adult, you'll love me for it. So now they become adult and they're outside and this is, geez, everybody knows our yeah. name. Yeah. Everybody yeah. knows who we are. Everyone knows you like yeah. a whole bike. He says, I'm so glad you did that. I remember sophomore year, uh, my dad was always like, you know, hey, you're a whole biker. If you go for it, you can get anything kind of thing. So sophomore year, I make varsity football. I'm like, this is amazing. Varsity football coach looks at me and I'm, I'm probably talking because real ADD. And he looks at me, he goes, whole biker, you talking over there? I'm like, like, I didn't want to say yes. And he goes. Oh, yeah, it's you like a hobika. Now go take a lap. Everyone always made fun of the you like a hobika. And I'm like, Dad, this sucks. This is horrible. But as as he said, Memorable. it sticks. Yeah. It sticks. And Memorable. now, as an adult, I don't care if I go to a networking meeting, I go somewhere. I if I say you like a hobika, I'll be like, hey, it's that jingle. Yeah, I know your family. So it's it's very well known to Phoenix. So good. Yeah. I'm going to pause uh, on the storyline because I need to ask about these button, these little uh, pins on your. <laughs> on your shirts there. What does 100% mean? Yeah, I know what so, the American flag means, at yeah. least to me. So tell me about both. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll, I'll start with 100%. So basically, um, our philosophy in life, my philosophy in life that I've um, you know brought Andy up is, as well as our entire company, because I bring my life lessons to my company and our culture is, every day, it's you know just an amazing day. We're just lucky to be alive and have that day available. So Every day is worthy of giving 100% of yourself. It's not like you need to save half of yourself or part of yourself for another day. That's not the way it works. You're not going to use your entire self up. Any individual can give 100% of themselves every day to everything. And the next day, wake up and give another 100%. It's not like you'll wear out. You can always give 100. No day is worthy of less than 100. So 100%, it basically, it's a reminder you get up in the morning, you put it on your lapel, and while you're putting it on every day, you remind yourself, you know what? Today, I'm going to give 100% at everything that I do. And then we have a program within our company where we recognize team members that have gone above and beyond and given 100%, whether it's with another team member or it's a customer or just some individual that they helped on the side of the road or someone in need. They did a good deed, and they're recognized by another team member, so they are now part of the Hobika 100% Club. We'll bring it up in our meetings, and uh, he'll be like, well, it's time to give it. And he'll pull names out, and he'll be like, I have a story about Trevor. And he'll bring Trevor up and say, Trevor did this, this, and this, and he deserves 100%er. And then people are looking like, hey, I want one of those damn pins. <laughs> Just yes. you know, going above and beyond and doing those extra things. Yeah. So, so they'll collect them. They'll end up with you know five or 10 or 15 pins throughout the year, and they're just <laughs> proud of them. And then we have a contest at the end of the year where we, we have a drawing of about 100 different gifts that I'll buy anywhere from $25 to $500. And basically, uh, you get to choose a gift for free and walk out with all these gifts. So it's, it's a lot of fun. It's reward, but it's recognition, and it's publicly recognizing others for good things and accomplishments. And that's what we're all about, just building our culture on doing good deeds, building positive, memorable experiences. You know, that's a little bit about the 100% pin. And before you talk about the flag, because we love our flag, um, and same thing that he said, it's, it's literally looking at the mirror. We do the same thing. You wake up. You put the pin on your shirt, and I'll literally look at myself in the mirror every morning. You can ask my wife. She calls me crazy. If I'm not willing to go 100% today, I might as well take the pin off and stay home. Mm -hmm. So you're either going to go 100% or go nothing uh, because that's what we believe in. So good. Yeah. Was there ever a time for either of you that you thought that maybe the family business wasn't for you? Maybe for you when you, know, when you were younger? Yeah. Yeah. So um, – Graduate from, you know, thinking like high school and going to college and what do you want to do for a career? And um, it is tough working out, you know, in the environment, in attics, on roofs. Uh, it is hard work. The trades, whether it's plumbing, drain, sewer, electrical, HVAC, it is hard work. You're working in really tough environments. So I grew up in that and learned a, a very challenging, through challenging work ethic and hard work. However, so I, I'm in college and I'm thinking, you know what, you know, I think I'd like to be an attorney. Right. So I wanted to go into law. So I go to college and I'm leaning towards uh, the law uh, direction. And it was late my junior year in college. I was on uh, jury duty. So I got called for jury duty and I was on a jury trial for two weeks. So I'm maybe, you know, 20, 21 years old. I'm on two weeks. And it was an individual that worked in a cotton uh, gin facility here. He was young, maybe in his 20s, married, had a couple kids. 
and he got his arm cut off to the shoulder. The whole arm was taken off. So he was suing the manufacturer. The only reason his arm got cut off is because he bypassed the safeties, all the safeties that the manufacturer had put in place. So I'm on a a jury with 11 other individuals. There's 12 of us and there's 11 that want to award him his case and charge it against the manufacturer. I'm saying, wait a minute. No, no, no. He says, no, it is not a manufacturer issue here. This is a personal responsibility and personal choice. He chose to bypass all the safeties to stick a broom stick in there to be able to you know, delodge why it's clogged up and he got sucked into it and his arm got cut off. So I feel sorry for not the guy. Not denying it's tragic. Yeah, yeah. So that was a transition. So I was able to convince the other 11 jurors that, you know what, black and white, you know, take emotions out of us. I know we feel sorry for him and his wife and the little kids, but it's not a manufacturer issue, right? So he'd have to go a different route. You can't put charges against the manufacturer and award him this case. So that was a turning point in my life. Uh, I sat on that case for two weeks and watched the attorneys. And I said, you know what? I don't want to sit behind a desk in a jury room for this amount of time, just wasting unnecessary time. I said, I I really like to be active and physical and working with my hands and my mind. And, you know, I'm Andy's got me on, on the hyper mode. You know, he's a lot more energy, but I have more miles on me. However, I, I needed to be out doing things, whether it was working. I like fixing things, whether it's a system, a process, you know, coaching individuals, leading them, or it could be anything mechanical. So I like hands-on, whether it's people interaction or equipment, that's me. So that was the turning point saying, you know what? Law isn't for me. I'm going to go into and I'm going to, you know, buy my father's business with my older brother, Paul, who was seven years older than I had an engineering degree. So that was the route I went. Sounds like a great partnership yeah it was too, very very yeah, yeah. Very good talking about talking about energy and bringing out the hyperness it's funny because my dad does have I, I guess he had some ADD when he was younger and he gets in his comfortable zone and you can see it come out but he is all business and he he, he stays confident and he's more I guess you would say that's what I'm looking for precise with his decisions than I am uh, but that's why it's you know so good having a father figure and a mentor like him but when we do get together and we're hanging out it's an unstoppable team, him and I. So no kidding. Good. And yeah. how about for you? Was there ever a time maybe when the jingle came out, you were like, I am, I'm finding yeah. something else. I don't not, know. Not so much. Yeah. It was it was in my 20s. So working full time as a technician, let's just say it was worth it. And I know why he did it. We talked about him being hard on me and growing up and now I'm an amazing human being for it. But it was really hard working for him because he was so stern. We'd have a group of people like three or four technicians doing something wrong. I saw it happening, but I'm a technician. I'm not a supervisor. I let it happen. And then he'd find out. Everyone gets written up. And then he'd sit me down and say, why'd you let this happen? Like, you saw everyone misbehaving. Why didn't Why didn't you tell me about it? I didn't want to be a rat. I didn't want to do this. You know, didn't want to do these things. It's unacceptable. You do that again, and you're not going to work here anymore. Kind of attitude. And I was like, why am I getting picked on? Well, he put me on a higher level to obviously create the human being I am today. So I didn't appreciate it at the time <laughs> and would always come home. I'm like, this sucks. My dad's just picking on me. And He was picking on me, but for a good reason. Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, I mentioned earlier that I have a 15-year-old. I have a 28- and 26-year-old as well, and they're in the the valley on their own. My 15-year-old, it's just he and I. And as a solo parent, I I get to play both roles. And so sometimes he gets to the point where he's like, Mom, you're so strict. Or as you said earlier, you know, so-and-so gets to do this. I'm like, you're not (laughs) so-and-so. I'm only responsible for you. So (laughs) you can continue to compare yourself or you can show up and and follow what we're doing as a family and and know that there's the benefits that's going to benefit you down the road. And to go in on that, sorry to say, but when I was younger, high school, maybe after high school, the people I was hanging out with that got to do whatever they wanted, I'm sorry to say, I'm not going to say any names, but they may not be doing so good in life right now. Right. So the reason I am the way I am is because of my father. And you can ask my wife, we'll go on double dates all the time we go out. All my friends are like 20 years older than me. People my age didn't get the upbringing I got, so I have to hang out with more mature people. That's how it works. My kiddo just got a job at Chick-fil-A, his first job at 15 and a half. Great environment. And before he did, I made him create a resume on Canva. Yeah write a cover letter. He's like, you've got to be kidding me. Nobody's going to want this. I'm like, well, we're getting in the car. Pick the places. We're going to 20 of them. Sure. Beautiful. Good mom. And Yeah. And uh, at the end of the first day, we had 15 passed out. By the time we got home, Chick-fil-A and Dairy Queen had called for an interview. Beautiful. He was hired in his first interview. I'm like, 
see, buddy, this is how it works. You stand up and you stand out and then the, the world is ready to receive you. But that day is going to stick with him 20 years from now and be like, yeah, my mom made me go out and pass out these 15 things. I hated it. But he you did. know what? This is the reason. He got back yeah. in that car and whined and complained after the third one. I <laughs> yeah. said, here is here is what you have to choose. You can choose to have me drive you around to these locations and pass out resumes, or you can walk or ride your bike and do it. If we're going to do it in the car, you're going to do it without complaining. Or you can do it completely on your, on your own, and you are doing it. I so yeah, I I, so I get, lesson. I get, yeah. I get being a loving parent, and also really having modeling the values and, and insisting that our kids show up in that way. So yeah, it's kind of like you know the parent thing when you know the father <laughs> you know hanging out with their sons or daughters, and you know you want to be friends and buddies. And I would always you know tell my boys, I said, you know what, at this stage in your life, before you're an adult. You know, we're not friends and buddies. I'm your dad. Yep. Bottom line, I'm your dad. I said, you know, once you're on your own and you're off of the bank of dad and you're leading your own life, then we can be buddies. Yes. And more, more on that, you know, me and my dad are very close now, so I'm comfortable saying this, but insecure growing up and uh, I got picked on a lot. I wasn't found on my father, you know, at the end of the day. Yeah. At, at that age, yeah. I was always picked on. I uh, I got grounded a lot. I was in trouble a lot. I was I was the black sheep of the family. Black sheep of the family is, is what it is. <laughs> but but um, as well. I felt like my father um, maybe didn't care for me as much just because he was so hard on me. But now we're best friends. Yeah. And out of both my brothers, my other two brothers, I think we're the closest now. I love it. So this is very beneficial. Did you say you're on the top of the will? <laughs> you're number one in the will? That's what I heard, oh, Lou. Okay, gotcha. yeah. Is that, yeah, yeah, you heard it here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to make make sure that sticks. Thank you. Let, oh, what else? So let's round out the conversation around the company. I, I When I was reading your, your company description, I smiled because it was all, you know, the trades, heating, cooling, plumbing, sewer, drain, electrical, and then wine. And I thought, oh, yeah. well, we've got to talk about that. How did that come up? Yeah, so sure. real, I'll go into it, and then he'll go into specialty. Is, so you wine, guys have done this a yeah. time or two before, <laughs> haven't you? Like, I can yeah, just— I can go. I can go have— You haven't? We've never no, done a podcast not together. together. No. Yay, Individually. I feel so First honored. One together. First one. I feel so honored. Yeah. And I, oh, you're so good at it. I yeah. literally could go and have coffee, and, and Daryl can <laughs> oh. whistle me back yeah, when you're done. Not? Yeah, he'll take a break. So, wine. So, wine, um, we really wanted to open up, and actually, his uh, one of his younger brothers, Michael Bica, actually leads in that division, but um, uh, he's very smart. He's an engineer. He gets to look at it more of a, like, let's build the room, and then the wine second, let's make it comfortable. Mm. Right. So, uh, a lot of people on a smaller spectrum will take, you know, in PV, I have a pantry. I have a closet. I'm going to turn it into a wine cellar. That's where we come in and be able to, at the end of the day, people that own wine cellars, what else do they own? Probably like 15 air conditioners. Yes. So it, it gets us in the door, but it's that specialty thing that most HVAC companies do that not really offer. really is smart. Yeah. 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 But but we, we love them and uh, we have a lot of family members with them. We actually just finished one of my brother's house up on Camelback Mountain. So um, it's uh, uh, very special and uh, we love them. Uh, but I'll let Lou talk about the technical of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so the whole wine thing came because I grew up in the refrigeration industry. So it was all refrigerated product and we would do wine rooms for restaurants and homeowners you know, back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. So I got really good at the refrigeration aspect. So air conditioning, you have temperatures go like this from top to bottom. You have air conditioning, then you have uh, high temp, then you have medium temp, then you have low temp, then you have ultra low temp. So wine is high temp. It's not air conditioning, it's below that. So we're talking about 55 degrees at a 50% relative humidity is where you want to keep most reds. That's the good storage temperature and for preservation. So we got really good at building wine rooms in the late 90s and early 2000s. We said, you know what, we're going to blow this up and really offer wine rooms because more and more homeowners were wanting their own wine room, wine cellar in their home. Mm -hmm. So like Andy said, it's our perfect avatar for the customer that we want to acquire because we own the home with all the major services. A wine connoisseur, somebody that has a wine room, we're not talking a little hobby here. Right. This is a huge expense. The wine room could Thousands be- Thousands of bottles. Oh, could yeah. be 100000 to $500,000 just for the room, mm -hmm. you know, and then their inventory can be anywhere from 10000 to a couple hundred thousand dollars in yep. just wine. I have serious. customers that say, look at this bottle, don't touch that row, like a five or 20 grand a piece. I'm like, for a wine bottle. But yeah, this for is drinking these the people. wine. Yeah. So anyways, this is yeah. our perfect avatar for the perfect customer because they have- Lots of homes, lots of HVAC, lots of plumbing, lots of electrical needs. They have electric vehicles. They need EV chargers. So we take care of all that. And then all of their friends have yes. the same likes. Yes. So the referral, you own the home, you own everything they do. And then they refer you to everybody. And people just like to work with somebody that they like and they trust. They walk into a home for one of these, you know, wine parties. 
you should check out my new wine cellar that Hobica Services just created for me. Yep. Holy crap, I got to get them over to my house. It's yep. amazing. And like wine walls are the big deal these days. <laughs> yes. So instead of like a cellar or a room, Andy mentioned a number of areas because we don't have a lot of basements here per se cellars. Right. So it could be a spare room, a pantry, a under wall. a staircase. <laughs> But wine walls have become very yeah. popular. See so, ones. Yeah. yeah. Room to room. So you have a wall yeah. that ends oh, I've that seen doorway yeah. and you can see all the all way through. Glass. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. So again, th I'm just smiling because <laughs> the untrained eye was like, wine room? That's just so obscure. Yeah. So Makes am I hearing that you need a wine room I don't in drink. Your I stopped room? a year ago. Stopped <laughs> drinking a year. Not that it was a problem, but I just decided life for me. Gotcha. So it's actually really be funny. It. You'll go to some neighborhoods. I'm not saying Amazing. that some neighborhoods aren't as nice as others, but you'll go out to a neighborhood that's not... Maybe you look at the neighborhood, oh, they can't afford wine rooms. Well, some people like wine. So we'll build a wine room, and they maybe hold a 1,000 bottles of wine on their racks, and they only have a couple hundred that they actually drink because some of our customers have admitted openly, I'm going to say their names, that it's just for show because the whole bottom racks, it's just colored water inside right. the wine bottle. But it looks cool. It looks cool. And you can give that, you can give that tip when you're, you're It's kind of like when installed. someone rents a Ferrari. You know? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so brilliant how it all ties together. It just, it makes complete sense. Congratulations. And how long, I'm sorry, how long have you been doing the wine rooms? It's wine rooms, I'd say we onboarded and went full out with an independent service about year 2000. So yeah. about 20, 23 Incredible. years. Real popular in the last like 10 years. Oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's round out the conversation around your services. Are you always, are you looking for teammates right now? I would imagine, especially in the trades, yeah, so, we need more great yeah, trade workers, we do. don't we? we do. And I, again, we don't hire for skill, I hear right? So we just hire for personality and likability. Yeah. So we are always hiring. We have a hiring event the third Thursday of every month at 6.30 p.m. At our location. So every month, yeah. all the time. So we're always hiring. It's not like we get busy, we hire. Because you can't find anybody when we're busy or we're getting into season because yeah. everybody else needs individuals. Yeah. So that's not when we so hire per se. We're always hiring, looking for good people to add mm -hmm. for our team. Yeah. And say we found Karen. And you know what? Maybe we didn't have a place for, but Karen's going to be an excellent add to our team. Mm -hmm. We're going to find a place for Karen. Gosh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, we will. Uh, and the website for the business is? That is hobica.com. H O B A I C A. H O B A I C A dot com. So good. dot com. Wow. Okay. Helping the homeless one bag at a time. Tell me a little bit about the way in which you're yeah. serving our community beyond the great work you do with your so company. So I'll start with the whole building of this and letting Andy get into the one bag at a time. So my upbringing was always my father, you know, was always blessed had a large family and he always attributed it to the good Lord has blessed me. And since I am blessed, you know, my role in life is to bless other individuals. So that's what we do today. We believe in blessing others. So I always grew up with helping those in need, whether it was food, housing, or maybe business or just life, just to be able to help them along in life, some obstacles or challenges that they're having in life and helping them through with what we were blessed with. So that's the way I grew up, always giving back. We did a lot of air conditioning, refrigeration services for free, helping individuals when they needed. And that's the way Andy, you know, was brought up as well, always serving and helping those in need. So I'll let Andy pick it up with where the one bag at a time, you know, came up mm -hmm. with. So gr growing up, you know, my parents always said, you know, you see someone in need, help them. So a lot of people will say, like, you know, I'll skip forward a little bit. Andy, why are you helping that person? They're probably taking advantage of the system. They could be parked around the corner. Hey, you're right, possibly. But it's, it's not my area to judge. It's my area to help. Whatever they give them five bucks, you're helping someone. Whether you're helping them buy alcohol, drugs, or something good, you helped them. They chose to do what they want to do. So help or just don't help. Um, so growing up, we'd go to church on Sundays, Catholic family. And then after church, a lot of the times we'd go to like soup kitchens and help out and feed the homeless and stuff like that. So it was real fun as a, as a young child. And I actually really enjoyed it. And a lot of my brothers or friends would be like, oh, we got to do that again. I loved it because I'd stand in line when you pass the food over to their plate, I'd start talking to them I'd be like, Andy, you're back. And I'd create a relationship with these people. And a lot of them have mental disabilities and they'd always see a smile when I would be in, you know, part of my line. It was, it was real fun. You get to, you know, life, high school, sports, girls, weightlifting, all the fun stuff. And then you just lose track of it. And you don't do it anymore. So it's just, you know, you get busy and you have a lot of stuff going on, working on all my free time. I reached age about 23, 24, mid-20s, bought my first house, had a couple of roommates paying my bills. My dad taught me that. And then me and my roommates would always be like, you know, I wonder what we're going to do this weekend. I'm bored. If you're bored, you can find something to do. So I thought, you know what I'm going to do? 
I'm going to go buy some stuff at the store, buy some bags, pack them, and pass them out to the homeless. This would be fun. So we did it a couple times, and then I would carry them around in my car, um, in, my, in my service vehicle, a Hobaika, running between calls. Every time I would see someone begging for food, begging for you know money, I would be like, hey, I don't have any money for you, but there's a ton of stuff in this bag. Sooner or later, man, they open up the bag, they look at you, some of them would start crying, will you pray with me? Just They're so, so happy and um, just, you know, that I was able to do such a small thing for them. It was so big. So that started on a small scale. Then I said, how are we going to blow this up? Let's start going downtown where the heart of homeless is. And we went to Tempe, Scottsdale, some different areas, but downtown Phoenix, you know, right by Cass Homeless Shelter at 12th and Jefferson, mm -hmm. You, you, huge homeless population. Even when I started doing this like 12, 13 years ago, real big, and we'd set up tables with tents and start passing out, you know, basically it starts off, the first table would have like water, Gatorade. Then you have five or six different food items. We have toiletries, baby wipes, shampoo, conditioner, anything. So you know, we really, we don't, you know, we take for granted these little things. What if you woke up this morning and you couldn't take a shower and brush your teeth because you don't have those items anymore? Couldn't take a shower. So, you know, one of the most important things that people ask for is baby wipes. And we actually had those made in bulk, but a baby wipes is a shower in a box is what they call it. Because um, a lot of people don't get to take a shower at nighttime like we do. I take two showers a day, so very spoiled. Fast forward a little bit. In business, going into sales about nine years ago, I'm part of an organization called BNI, Business Networking International. President Nate Dominguez, a friend of mine. My brother was big in BNI because my brother's also in sales, doesn't work for the company. Uh, but my brother Dan said, You need to join BNI. So I joined BNI, start creating relationships, and, you know, obviously get that likability out. And this individual, Ted Young, he's actually the vice president of One Bag at a Time at, right now, but walked up to me and said, Hey, Andy, you, you get back to the homeless. You have these events, right? I want to go to one. So he started coming event after event after event. Walked up to me one day at BNI and says, Andy, why aren't you a 501c3? Yeah. I said, dude, I've tried. And he goes, what do you mean you've tried? I said, I filled out the paperwork five or six times. I even had my dad help me out. And I get denied every time. I don't understand why. And he said, yeah, uh, it's a paperwork thing. So he's a financial advisor and my financial advisor. He also does some stuff for my dad. But he's really good with paperwork, really good at the little fine things and very smart individual, totally different aspect of mine. I'm good with people. He's good with paperwork, totally different person. But he did the paperwork and got me improved in two months. So he's the reason I'm a 501c3. Ted Young is amazing. Good friend of mine was part of my wedding. On the back burner, Ted's the vice president, does a lot of the paperwork stuff and then goes to all the events. But now that we're a 501c3, we're growing bigger and better. And then we'll be at our next stage here in probably about a year, maybe a year and a half. You have to actually be a nonprofit 501c3 for a matter of like six to eight years. And then you can move up to the next step to where you can collect, you know, tax donations and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. that's the next step to keep growing it. As I started getting bigger, I'd say about, what do you think, Dad, about seven, eight years ago when you and Mom got really involved? Oh, uh, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, so about seven, eight years ago, it was real small. I'd have like four or five friends there. Right. Then I became a 501c3 and we started blowing it up. And my dad's like, yeah, I'll come down. Like, let's try this out. Like, he's a busy guy, but he started stepping away from, you know, business roles a little bit, hiring more people. So he had to not work 80 hour weeks anymore. And he started uh, coming with me to the events, my mom. And then ever since then, they come to every single event. So we plan it around our schedules because they're, they're a part of it. And my dad really runs the events. So <laughs> we go out, we set up the tables and we, people start lining up to get the goods. My dad's job is to get on the megaphone and make sure everyone's ready. They get in line, they follow the rules. And then he walks up and down the streets to make sure that people get out of the tents that come down to our event. It's get really him, fun. Get them there. Yeah. 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 What needs do you have then from our community? So for our viewers and our listeners who are interested in getting involved, how can we help? Go for it. Yeah. So uh, follow us on Facebook. That's how yeah. we communicate and uh, list all our events. So okay. it's one, one bag minute. at a time on Facebook, basically. As well there's, on Instagram. Yeah. And Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a donate link there. And we have an event every month uh, at 12th Avenue in Jefferson near the Cass Homeless Shelter. You have Cass. You have uh, St. Mary's Food Bank. There's St. Vincent de Paul. There's a bunch of homeless facilities there. Our next event is actually on June 24th. Starts at 8 a.m. We set up at 7.30. People say, you know, what if I can't get there till 8.30? You might as well not come because from 8 to 9, we'll serve anywhere between two and 500 people like that. Um, and uh, uh, it's a real quick event, but I'll guarantee anyone comes out, it'll change your entire month and you'll feel better about yourself that you helped. And uh, months that I'm too busy to have an event, oh, I miss it. Yeah. I look forward to it every month. Yeah. Where, so, where's the supplies coming from? Yeah. So basically uh, donations. We ask for donations of anything you can one hour of your time, bring donations, whether it's toilet paper, you know, whether it's non-perishables, it's personal care needs, it's clothing, it's sunscreen, it's chapstick, 
anything and everything in regards to that. So we look for donations from individuals or money. As well, now onebagatatime.org. You go to the page, and I think right down at the front, you can click on the PayPal link right there. Right, Right. yeah. Good. Yeah. So donations from individuals out of state, money or companies, uh, and then we will buy you know, supplies, Andy will make a Costco run usually, you know, Friday, Saturday before the event and get all of our necessary needs and non-perishables that we typically get. And we have a number of branded items. We have deodorant branded with yeah, one I bag at a time. Wipes, I heard. We have yeah, our wipes, bags, yeah. we have our wipes, we have chapstick, we have shampoo, we have lotion, conditioner. So a number of branded one bag at a time promo items that, uh, you know, we, we want to help out as many people as possible, right? right? So if you go straight to the source, and you yep. buy the products straight from where they come from, yes. and you're able to buy 10,000 at a time, and you buy in bulk, you can help out that many more people. Because at the end of the day, when you walk into a Walgreens and you buy your chapstick for 99 cents, let me ask you as, as a person, so if you didn't know any better, how much do you think it costs that chapstick to make? Well, not much. Probably like half a penny. So yes. <laughs> when you buy 10,000 of them and yeah. you can get them for a dollar fifty a piece or you know 80 cents a piece, I can help out that many more people. Right. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and how what what have you seen that the impact impact has been in your journey with this nonprofit? What are you noticing? And there's clearly still a need. It's gotten worse and it's worse over the years. Awful. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to let my dad talk about it. He's very passionate about it. How it started with just homeless people and then people coming out of cast to join our events to where it is today. It's out of control, but I'll let dad talk about 10 cities. Yeah, yeah. Originally, it was, a, you know, a smaller homeless community. We'd still have anywhere from two to 400 individuals in a one-hour time frame we were able to serve. They typically, the homeless would, you know, sleep and live in the parks and underpasses and anywhere they could find a place to be able to spend the night and live. Uh, about three years ago, it was during the COVID, you know, pandemic time frame, an organization came down and gave out tents. So pretty soon, the whole six, eight block district down there at 12th and Jefferson became like tent city. It was a tent community and it's gotten fairly ugly, you know, murders, drugs, prostitution. It's gotten, you know, very ugly. However, um, we still go down there, even though individuals say, hey, you know what? That's kind of a dangerous place to go. Um, I don't deem it that way. Um, We've never been bothered we're there just to be able to give back and serve others. Everybody's always, you know, very nice and appreciative. And it isn't our position to judge, you know, an individual, individual, you know, people will say to us like, you know, are you really making a difference? What good are you doing by giving somebody some non-perishables or personal care needs or clothing? You know, they're just going to use it that day. They're probably going to throw it away. Are you really helping them? I said, you know, well, it isn't our place to be able to judge that. At least we're making an impact for them at that moment that day. Because if you you go to the bathroom every day, like number two every day, right? What if you didn't have toilet paper right. or a wet one? That's a big deal. If you don't clean up well, you got personal problems. I said, so the little things in life can be huge. And our place is just to be able to help those that are in need. And hopefully we can take them to a better place and just not judge them. You know, we think the good Lord will be there to be able to lead them in the right direction. And if they're there with us when we're able to serve them, you know, just being in the right place at the right time, sometimes that makes, you know, the big differentiator. That's my prayer every morning. To go on the little stuff that we take advantage of every day, right? People say, Andy, I want to come to your event this weekend. What should I bring? I always pause, look them in the eyes and say, well... If you woke up tomorrow and you were homeless, mm. what would you like throughout the day that you normally wouldn't have? Now, for, yeah. remember, nothing at home that you own. You have a backpack. It's on your back. What do you want in that backpack? Yeah. Well, wipes. Mind blown. <laughs> Everything. Yeah. yeah right? I, know, I know I want Couple wipes. A couple snacks, water. Like, yep. it, it gets pretty hard to yep. where, you know, you yeah. can't just keep walking in 7-Elevens and ask them for a water cup. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, incredible, exactly. incredible work. Did you guys attend the St. Vincent de Paul breakfast this year? Or yes, have you we ever? did. Yes. Yeah, I was there as well. Yeah, and I the, go statis- every year to that. the statistics were mind blowing. Yeah, huge. And really. Um, so, my grandfather actually was really involved in St. Vincent de Paul. Yeah. His father, the founder of Hobaika. Yeah, he, he gave, oh man, he gave back so much to St. Vincent de Paul. You want to talk more about that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, my, yeah. my father grew up, he was heavy into St. Vincent de Paul and huge. giving back to our community, but. Uh, I think he spent a good 50 years, you know, with St. Vincent de Paul organization. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to, uh, that several of the organizations that you've mentioned, people are not working in a silo anymore, which I think they were for a while, some of our nonprofits. We all are trying to, not we all, but those of us who are trying to make a difference, let's say in the homeless community specifically, 
people were like, this is the way we're doing it. You do your thing over here. You do your thing over there. I'm seeing, especially with interviews that we've done here, it's not that way anymore. People are looking at how can we collaborate? How can we come together? Would love it. Yep, yep. Ab- absolutely. So I'm happy to hear that you I've guys told people, say, hey, we've actually went down there. I'm like, we should come on the same day. Why isn't this yes. a humongous event? Yeah, mm-hmm. there's a couple. I know I mentioned uh, John Murphy and Arcadia Foundation. Before we got on air, I want to make that introduction. And there are a couple of other organizations that are taking care of um, the female products for their periods Huge. for our homeless nice, and our incarcerated. Yeah. So it, it'd be another a great introduction for Fantastic. you guys because, of, of course, those needs around feeling clean, feeling whole, right. make that difference. I love the way you put it. That one moment of time, if we can help somebody in this very moment, then we're making a difference. 100%. Yeah. It's interesting that I mentioned to you that Daryl uh, is – is moving on from us, and he introduced me to our new studio producer who owns the porch in Prescott. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he and his wife, Rudy, are phenomenal people, Jesse. And they shared a story about a woman who came into their coffee shop not too long ago. I think she might have been a wheelchair or a walker or whatever, kind of head down. Jesse knows that it was a Sunday morning. It's also a church entryway. And it was busy, but he went over and took a minute to say hello to her, welcome her, what can I get you? And she put her headset on, she started working, and she you, you wouldn't even have noticed, he said, that all these other people were around her that she was even paying attention. She became a regular after that, and then I, I don't know how long, maybe a couple of months, she said, I'm moving to Phoenix, but I want to thank you and Rudy for making me feel so welcome. And they exchanged phone numbers, and they read a text to me when I was up there interviewing uh, Jesse to come and join our team. She had said that she was on the brink of suicide. Wow. And his loving care, his willingness to just make eye contact and walk over, even though he had an extraordinarily busy day and she looked like she wasn't interested in having a conversation with anybody, changed her life. So to your point, in that one moment, we have an opportunity. We always have an opportunity to get outside of ourselves and just show up. And I had started to say earlier, my prayer every day is, use me. How can right. I be used today? I, Let me get out of my own stuff <laughs> and I try, just put people in front of me. I try to me. preach that every day. Yeah. I'll tell people that I've created a couple of videos on social media. Um, I, I post probably two to three videos a week just trying to motivate people, try to just just make people be, be better people. In a couple of weeks, I posted a video on exactly what you just said. I don't care if you're walking into a grocery store, into the gas station, into work, out of work. If you make eye contact with someone, smile and say, hey, I hope you have a great day. Or, hey, good morning. You look beautiful. I like your dress. Just say something. That little sentence could change that person's whole life. Maybe they're on the brink of suicide. Maybe they just lost lost a loved one. Maybe they're having the worst day of their life, but you're having a great day. A simple smile and a hello is going to change that. doesn't cost a dime. Yeah, so to add on to that, what most individuals, I mean, you go through your life and you come across a lot of opportunities that you could bless or potentially bless somebody's life and make a, make a difference. But most individuals, they, they'll look at them and they'll have an opportunity and they'll say, yeah, you know what? I'm not going to do that. So my recommendation to any individual listening is listen to whether you want to call it the Holy Spirit or the voice within you. There's always somebody talking and just listen to that voice. And if you follow that voice's instruction, I guarantee it won't lead you wrong. Quit trying to make sense out of it and make your own decision. Just listen to the voice. As long as it's good for you, for them, and everybody involved, it's something that you should listen to and follow. So I call it the Holy Spirit, but whatever you want to call it, just listen to that voice and you'll do good things. And being in the right place at the right time, you'll make big impacts that'll change people's lives. Boom. So that's the fifth time in this conversation. And I don't think I've ever had that thought more than once in the, how many episodes have I done over 300, 400, that I know that my son needs to listen to our conversation today. I've thought of it several times and that's Fabulous. just, yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to having Ivan hunker down and, and may, listen may, to the may, wisdom. Maybe your son has a future with us. Maybe. I would like <laughs> to see that. I, I, he wants to be an engineer. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I keep pushing kind of the trades and explore a little mm-hmm. bit because we really need great workers. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so uh, you, you you can make some good money when people actually see what they can do. Yeah. So it's not a you know you come and work your butt off and you don't get paid for it. It's a very highly paid industry if you actually can you know produce you know do do these kind of things. Not an easy job, but uh, we have several people, including myself, that maybe weren't meant for college that can make a good yeah. living just obviously uh, creating those relationships and making people happy. Well, we'll talk. <laughs> I mm. love it. What have I not thought to ask about either Hobika or uh, one bag? Sorry, one bag at a time. Yeah. 
anything else that you, as you were coming over today, that you thought, let's make sure we well, share. I didn't want to skip over the ending of the 100% pin and the American flag. Yeah. So obviously we wear, we, we wear the American flag every day because we love our country. Yes. And if you work for us, you love our country. If you disagree, you can go live somewhere else. So at the end of the day, we, we support our troops. Yes. Me and my dad, we released a video a couple of weeks ago on Instagram and Facebook about red shirt Fridays. Mm -hmm. So we wear red shirts on every Friday and we tell all of our inside uh, people in the office to wear red shirts just to support because red shirt Friday is supporting the blood of people that we've lost across seas in our military. And mm -hmm. we, we love our military and everything they've given for us. So uh, that's why we wear red shirt on Fridays. And that's why we wear our American flag every every day. Freedom isn't free. We, yes, get, we, exactly. give the, we, we give these out to all of our customers. Yes. Yeah. Well, did you bring me one today? I do. I have a couple Not in my truck. Not a customer, but I'll take one. <laughs> we have lots of them. <laughs> Not a customer them, yet. I have them in my backpack here. <laughs> very good. I'll give Daryl a few. I've, Maybe Daryl will if, give you if one. If we've earned one, and Daryl has his red shirt on, so we're good. Yeah, he does. So Daryl's qualified. <laughs> yes. All right. So uh, onebagatatime.org. Mm -hmm. Very good. And hobica.com. .com. And both the company and the organization are on Facebook and Instagram. Yes. Hobica yeah. Services. Hobica Services, One Bag at a Time on Facebook. Hobika underscore services on Instagram, one bag at a time, AZ on Instagram. Um, and then if people want to get motivated, uh, I would think the number one place would be Andy Hobika on Instagram. I, I, I post these videos weekly and I just love motivating people. I'll literally have people, random people message me and be like, hey, I know, it, I, know I don't know you, but I just watched your video yesterday and I needed that. Thank you so much. Random. Love it. Yeah, it makes my day. I, I have so many introductions for you guys. My mind is just, all right, note to self. Let's, <laughs> let's, I'm, I, clearly you guys are very well, well connected as well. Uh, however, I feel like there's some opportunity for us to, to make some introductions to continue Perfect. to help you guys influence in the way that you are. So thank you again. And I'm so honored that it's the first time you two have done this together. Now you're, you got to stick, you got to say there to people, we Hey, we come with a package deal. <laughs> well, well, when people see this episode, I'm like, Oh my God, you got to get that team. <laughs> That's right. You've been listening to Phoenix business radio broadcasting live from the max six entrepreneur center. Some media leans left, some lean right. And we lean business until next time. I'm Karen Nowicki. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.